All right. Thank you again to our sponsor. Thank you to San Franciscan Coffee Roasters, our main sponsor. They've supported roast events for as long as I can remember since we started roast 20 years ago. So thank you very much. Let's get going with our first presentation of the day. Why green grading matters. First up, we have veteran Trish Rothgeb. Trish is co-founder and roast master for Wrecking Ball Coffee Roasters in San Francisco, California. Her experience in the industry spans over 30 years as a coffee roaster, quality control specialist, green coffee buyer, and entrepreneur. She teaches quality evaluation practices to coffee professionals around the world. And this is not in her official bio, but if you didn't know, Trish is accredited with coining the term third wave coffee, which I've always been so proud of her for, for getting credit for that. And thank you to our generous sponsor, Chobani, for sponsoring this session. Trish, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everybody. We're going to talk about getting right into it. We'll talk about um, why green grading matters. Green grading. Now, uh, this might be one of those things for some of you, or uh, maybe all of you. Where you think about it, you know about green grading. Some of you don't know very much about it, but um, it's something you probably overlook or you think, uh, I don't really need to bother so much with it or even think about it half the time. And that's because we're all working a lot. We have a lot to do. There's uh, not a lot of time to dork around with this kind of thing, to be honest. And because we live in this bubble of sort of specialty coffee, right? We we uh, have a lot of this done for us, and I'll touch on that as we move forward in this. But I think another way to look at this presentation, I, another title could be um, a critical look at green grading practices. And when I say critical, it means it's not so simple. It's not so uh, sort of black and white. Um, there's a lot more we have to think about when we engage in, in this practice of green grading. So we're gonna look at how to be more critical about how we do things to eliminate our prejudices and also challenge our standards because there are a lot of standards. Next slide, please, Lily. So in this talk, we'll talk about uh, the definition and the scope of green grading, uh, some technical parameters, which some of us know, maybe not like the back of our hands, but we know they exist. Then we're gonna talk about the nuance surrounding technical parameters. Sounds like an oxymoron, right? Sounds like there shouldn't be nuance if there are technical parameters, but uh, this is critical thinking, right? It's critical analysis of what we do. Then we're gonna talk just a little bit about the practice and application as it applies to you and others in the industry. Then maybe we'll talk a little bit about the why, and I'm hoping the why of all of this comes out in the Q&A a little bit, um, as I, I think that we can work together on why we do these things. And so when we get to the Q&A, uh, Hello again, I think Trish might be frozen. Yes, Trish is definitely frozen. Um, as we take a second to uh, get Trish back online, I wanna talk about the chat window. Oh my gosh, everyone's so supportive and so, so sweet. Um, and also, I can't believe there are people from all over the globe here. Um, Indonesia, Paris, Japan, it's insane, really warms my heart. And um, it's really exciting to see so many people engaged from around the globe. I am going to log off for a second and figure out how we get Trish back on. All right, I'll be right back.
back? Am I back? You are back. back. I'm back. Yeah, sorry. Woo! Okay. Moving right along. Everybody. All right. Great to see your welcome, face. Welcome to our digital uh, age. Let's hit the next slide. Uh, I think you heard what I said that resources come. So uh, what is grading? Some of us know that uh, we grade coffee every day. It's something we do every time we taste coffee in some way we're grading it. There's something like uh, we do when we taste coffee, we decide if it's good or bad. And so grading can mean a couple of things in our line of business. We can grade when it comes to scoring a coffee, which is what most of us do. And even though we don't use numerical grades all the time uh, or numerical scores all the time on our coffee to grade it in a formal sense, we are all making an evaluation of coffee at all times. For the purposes of this talk, and I think you know, uh, this talk is just going to be about the physical grading of coffee, so physical defect in coffee. Um, I think that it's important to note that, um, again, we do this every day. Uh, some of us don't bother. Some of us are really uh, into it just for the nerd, uh, the nerdiness of it. I, pr I promise I won't use that word again, nerd. It's probably enough uh, to use that. <laughs> once. Um, some of us never bothered to learn this, especially in uh, the specialty trade, and there's a good reason why in specialty we don't spend a lot of time worrying about this, and we'll get into this later, and that makes a lot of sense, uh, but there are places where this can work for us. So let's go to the next slide. Technical the technical uh, side of this has been published many times in many different forms. This is the one that most of us are probably used to. It's maybe, mm, let's see, almost 20 years old, I think. This is the um, defect poster that goes with the green grading handbook. Essentially, some of you have this in your roasteries or in your offices, gives you all the defects that are recognized by the Specialty Coffee Association. And when we say that this standard was developed, just a tiny bit of history, this standard was developed by people that came from all over volunteer membership of SCA. So it wasn't just uh, the United States members that worked on this, although there were plenty. There were a couple of Europeans, there were some uh, Colombians, South Americans, uh, like Brazilians, some Central American members, nobody from Africa and nobody from Asia that I was able to determine but in some ways it was based on a Western idea of coffee standards. Um, just so you know that it wasn't only uh, one vision, it was a vision that was trying to incorporate all the sort of common denominators. In other words, the, the, what we could all agree on as what is a, a defect. Um, because everybody has sort of their own schedule of defects, it's sort of regional, and we'll talk about that in a second. This is based on a washed Arabica, as it says at the top of this, and because at the time, and, and probably still true to a large extent, we value washed Arabicas. It should be noted that this standard, specifically this standard, can also work for natural or other processes that are uh, based in Arabica, or which Arabica uh, industry uses. We also have a separate um, schedule of defects for Robusta coffee. It's not all that uh, different, although some of you could probably talk better about that than I. I am not um, a Robusta grader from the CQI Q grader uh, side of things. I just specialize in Arabica. So this is one standard. It should be said again, there are many standards besides the specialty association standard, but the, pro the purpose of this specialty association standard was to create something that we could all agree on uh, across the world. So it doesn't cover everything, uh, much like the flavor wheel we have, doesn't cover everything, it's just the uh, main things. So we go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Lily. But the reality is that we don't know everything. Uh, so where we have different schedules of defects for different places all over the world, like Brazil has its own set of defects, um, Ethiopia has its own set of defects, uh, and so forth. We also don't know 
everything about every defect, right? We are, some people have said, we are in the age of scientific discovery in coffee. And I look forward to all of that. Uh, we um, have a lot to learn and to fully understand what the remedies are for any of these uh, defects, let alone what their cup quality is. So we assume a lot, but we don't know a lot. And that's because a whole scientific study hasn't been done on every single one of these defects. So much of what we know and, and we sort of rely on in coffee is sort of convention of conventional wisdom about a certain defect. This bean in a cup of coffee will taste, most of the time it will taste like this. And that again, as I said, comes from a certain point of view. So we don't have all of the world with an opinion about what a foxy bean should taste like. What is a foxy bean? We could talk about a foxy bean in a second. In this picture, and uh, I neglected to tell you who was in the very first picture, that uh, the very first picture on the title slide was a woman in Ethiopia who was uh, grading coffee at the, um, that at the, your, at, yes, there she is. She's grading coffee at the, um, it wasn't Clue, it was the, the ECX. What was then the ECX? So moving forward, this is uh, some farm workers in, on a farm on the outskirts of um, the city of Bali. So not very, you know, the center, city center, which is very touristy in Indonesia. Uh, in Bali, went out into the farmlands and they were washing the coffee. And if you can see here, they're also picking it right after what looks to be uh, pulping. So what is specific about what's happening here? Well, what's specific about what's happening here is that the people here have a certain thing that they've always done or that they learned from someone before them uh, about picking things out. So they're already doing the work for us in some ways. There's a certain climate that is, that's happening is specific to here. There's a certain uh, morning temperature and afternoon temperature. They have certain um, different uh, insect issues. They have uh, all manner of things that make this place unique. And so it's the variables about why they have a defect, the reasons why they have about whatever defect is um, specific to them and I can't stress that enough. And that's why I wanna say that it's important for us to know that there is nuance. Uh, what's another way to say nuance? Gray areas. There are <laughs> things we know that we like to try to adhere to like the specialty coffee schedule of defects and count them and be very correct about that. But there are things that we need to look at a little bit more critically. And let me give you some of the examples that I've come across uh, all over the world from teaching dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of students all over the world. I've been lucky enough to teach probably on every continent. We'll go to the next slide. There is nuance. There is nuance. So, let me give you some examples of nuance. This might be a, a big one for us because in specialty coffee, we see Quakers a lot. This is a picture close up of Quakers in a batch of roasted coffee. Quakers, uh, if you don't know anything about this, are uh, when the coffee doesn't develop in roasting. And sometimes we know why, and sometimes we don't know why. The, the textbooks or the schedule of defects will tell us that it's because we have an immature bean there uh, that didn't have what it needed to develop into a nice brown little nugget. Um, immatures, yes, immatures can do this, but they also might not do this when you roast them. It's really hard to say. I guess we could say most of the time this happens, um, all the time, I'm not sure. And what we really are looking for in a coffee uh, seed is that it has been developed into a ripe fruit and the seed inside is fully developed in that way that it was ripe when it was picked. 
and in, in that way has potential for those sugars to be converted into a nice uh, brown roasted coffee like this. So what are the culprits really of uh, a Quaker? And that is um, low density, low sugar content. Uh, I'm not a scientist and I didn't do a study on it, but seems to be the conventional wisdom, right? So are immatures the only reason why? I don't think so. And so we have to look at this and say, gosh, I looked through that green lot and I graded it. I didn't find any immatures and yet I'm popping up with all of these Quakers after the roast. Like, what's going on? Maybe you've had this, you've had this happen before. And uh, that would make a lot of sense because we're talking more about things like low density, potentially we have the potential of low sugar for whatever reason or low, low sugar potentials. And there's even things like uh, monsoon Malabar back in the day when I was just a kid learning how to roast, monsoon Malabar was all the rage. That was a novelty coffee that was uh, weathered on purpose. Put it out, uh, they said, put it out, in, they, they told us they put it out in a monsoon to weather. And every single bean in the lot was essentially a Quaker. And uh, I find that very interesting, a very low acid kind of an idea or floater, Quaker, floater, I don't know, but essentially we have these problems with trying to decide what happened to our coffee. And I also have a little story about when I was roasting a very expensive, well-renowned coffee that costs a lot of money at auction. Uh, so otherwise perfectly pristine when you looked at it, but then when you roasted it, there were Quakers. And if you know the standards, very strict in specialty coffee, if there are any Quakers there, uh, it's not considered a specialty coffee. Now, I'm not gonna get into that controversy about where the threshold for be, should be for specialty. But again, paid a lot of money for that particular coffee and it came up Quakers. I started asking questions to all my friends. Anyone who would know anything about this coffee, like why is this happening? And a friend kind of whispered in my ear, they found that if you opened up this coffee, the embryo was germinating. In other words, like starting to sprout inside the coffee. Isn't that interesting? Now, no scientific paper on this. This is all, you should all take this with a grain of salt because it was just hearsay, but essentially that could work, right? That it's sapping the sugars from the bean or something is happening inside that's changing that coffee so that it doesn't roast up all nice anymore. And uh, I found that to be a super interesting uh, little factoid about this coffee is that no matter how expensive, at one point, the most expensive coffee in the world, it still had Quakers, which kicked it out of specialty uh, on that technical side. You probably heard old timers, uh, people as old as I am or older than me talking about how all oh, that Ethiopian coffee wouldn't taste as good unless it had some Quakers in it. Well, uh, lo and behold, years later, we have a lot fewer Quakers in our Ethiopia and dang, it tastes great to me. And so I don't really take that as, as an opinion that I go with. Can we go to the next slide? This is, next slide, broken, chipped, and cut. And the nuance here is not that hard to grasp. The nuance here is that in the SCA schedule of defects, the uh, coffee beans on the left and the, cough, the one coffee bean on the right in this picture are counted as the same in sort of the same weight of uh, boo-boo. So on the right, you have a cut bean. It, it's not really very clear uh, in focus, but I, I am telling you that's cut and not, um, and not a severe insect damage because I took that picture. It's actually from a video. I'll tell you about the video later. And that happened at the wet mill and everything on the left, those two other ones were smashed and we could assume, we don't know because we weren't there, but we can assume that happened when it was hauled and the coffee was completely dry. Notice the dis discoloration at damage from the wet mill and no discoloration on the dried coffee on the left. And so we can only assume that these two cups of coffee, if they were in two different cups of coffee, would taste different and all manner of things can infect a broken chipped cut if it happens when the coffee is still moist and less dry and sort of uh, squishy, if you know what I mean. Anything can set into that cut and damage it even more. 
You could have flavors of ferment, you could have mold flavors, you could have no flavors that come off of that particular problem. The problem on the left, uh, what we have there is one of those defects that roasters hate. We hate broken chip cut, not only for cosmetic reasons, but broken chip cut at the dry mill means we're roasting all different shapes and sizes of coffee bean. And that's not good for heat transfer. As you know, it doesn't make for uh, a very nice cup of coffee if we have too many broken chip cut. Um, and that's why it sits in the, in the secondary defect, but we sure don't know enough about the, the one on the right. So this flows to how you work in your own lab. If you find a coffee that's been offered to you and it counts out as broken chip cut, but within reason, not so bad if you use the technical assistance of the, the book that's been issued and, and we're following the book and it says it's still specialty, but they're all wet mill damage. I think that that's one of those things you would apply a little bit of nuance to. Can we have the next slide? And this is along the same line, sort of an extension of the same thought, slight insect damage, severe insect damage. Slight insect damage, you can see uh, in this particular coffee, it's uh, one, one hole and it doesn't look like there's much discoloration in the bean uh, itself. And, this, and then the severe insect damage has lots of discoloration, um, lots of sort of like rotted out parts to that coffee. And um, a lot of, it's a wild card. When you have severe insect damage, you got a wild card there, right? Uh, anything could be, uh, you could have a coffee that just tastes kind of flat and sort of uninteresting. You could have a coffee that tastes uh, moldy, uh, maybe even medicinal. It could taste like mushroom. It could taste like anything because you don't know what settles into that hole after the insect has been there. The slight insect damage is interesting because if you go by the book, the book will tell you this is the least, uh, the least of your worries is a slight insect damage. One hole in the bean, you can get up to 10 beans with slight insect damage before you hit one full defect uh, in the specialty uh, book. So what we're saying here is that it really doesn't affect the bean that much. However, some of us know that anything could settle in that little hole and create any kind of, uh, I'm not a scientist, you guys. I don't know what's happening in there. Maybe some of you do know. Some of us are waiting for the papers to tell us where potato defect comes from, the potato flavor. Some have assumed that this is happening a lot in a specific place because of what settles into that hole after the insect gets in there. So one of those little holes in a certain place, in, coming from a certain place in the world can mean a lost lot entirely. So here's where we all need to be careful when we're going by the book. Next slide, please. Again, uh, like the theme of this entire uh, talk really is to pay attention to what the book says and what's really happening on the ground in the world. So foreign matter for me has always been one of those things because there's a certain place in the world ever since I've been roasting this coffee from this particular country, uh, 30 plus years. So more than three decades of specialty coffee, specialty grade coffees, uh, very good coffees, my favorite coffees, always has a kernel of corn in it. A little kernel of corn here, a little kernel of corn there. Sometimes you see them. In my most recent lot, I'm finding blue corn kernels, which are harder to find than the yellow corn kernels. And most often you find them after you've roasted them because it comes out in the cooling tray as a little piece of popped popcorn, which is a lot of fun. And then everyone laughs. But if you got one of these corn kernels, against the Specialty Coffee Association book, you have kicked that completely out of specialty because any foreign matter, anything that is not coffee, means it is not specialty, according to the book. The same thing with a little piece of uh, wood, a little piece of wood, anything that's not coffee, that uh, all, all of a sudden it is not a specialty coffee. 
a little tiny pebble or rock. So think to yourself, where did this coffee come from? Did this coffee, was it raked on a patio that was crumbling because they didn't have what it, you know, the time or the resources to, per, to kind of repair their patio and they're raking along the patio and it's kind of crumbling here and there and they get a little piece of the patio up into their, into their coffee as they're raking it. And all of a sudden you have a pebble there. Otherwise it's a patio dried coffee. Gosh, that sounds great to me. And so here we have an instance of, well, this is a big problem once it hits your grinder because it can seize up a grinder pretty easily, but it doesn't roast up and ruin the flavor of the coffee. It doesn't, uh, it wouldn't do as much as uh, if there was, you know, something rotten in the coffee, it's not influencing any of the other coffee beans. So really it's an issue of um, getting the pebbles out and you have a specialty coffee. So keeping that in context, when you think about the kernel of corn, do the people that rake their coffee on the patios, are they raking next to all of the corn that they have harvested? and they're trying to dry, or why are there, why is there corn around there? Um, listen, I don't know, but I'm telling you, it doesn't really bother the cup because all the coffee tastes great. Even if it gets in the roaster and comes out a pop piece of popcorn, it still tastes like a great cup of coffee. The little piece of wood, that one's a little bit more, it can roast up with the coffee and get ground into the coffee. That one has a little bit more chance, but in the end, what is it? It's just a little, wood, tiny wood flavor that's been kind of homogenized with everything else. You don't want a lot of it because then you're going to have a huge woody coffee. But are these things really uh, that big of a deal to me? I'm not going to, not going to lose sleep over foreign matter. This is the nuance. I don't lose sleep over foreign matter. Next slide, please. Okay. Here's a big one. That's a, it's a toughie. This is, um, a lot of reasons why I want to talk about sours. This is a full sour. Again, uh, a little bit blurry, but uh, it'll make more sense later when I show you where to find all these pictures. They're in a video and that's why they're a little bit blurry here. Um, full sour is one of those things where you have, uh, they look all different colors of brown and they're kind of, uh, um, sometimes they're more amber. A lot of times they're miss, classified, a lot of times people will pick a foxy out and call it a sour, in which case you've just ruined a whole lot of coffee and failed and rejected a whole coffee because you think a foxy is a sour. A foxy is when the outside silver skin layer that adheres to the coffee seed has been tinged red or dark red or a little bit brownish because of presumably stained by the coffee cherry. Now, that is not the same thing as a sour. And when you count those as sour, you are misusing your powers as a green grader. So I want everybody to look up foxies and find the difference between foxies and sours. And I'm gonna move on because I, we think we need to pick it up because I was late getting started. Next slide, please. This slide is uh, of a lab in Colombia in, at a mill. This mill is Rama Cafe, I believe. And you can see on the left is an Oliver machine. And on the right, you have somebody grading right under the light. And I can tell you that in Colombia, they're very, very uh, big on these standards by SCA. They help develop the standards. And for, for their purposes, it's done great things for this for this region, everything that comes out of Colombia, pretty much in the specialty um, category is pristine, it's beautiful, you can count on. When they say there's a certain number of defects, that's how many are in there. They are, uh, they are really getting it done there. I want you to notice that everything that we've talked about so far has already tried to be worked on before you get it. People have worked on this. Now uh, you can go, uh, we don't have a lot of time to get into it because I'm a little bit running past our time, but, and I want to leave room for a Q and A. You can find out how the Oliver works, but it's doing, doing tons of sorting for us. And then the person on the right, you can see the screens that are there that are helping uh, them find the size of the coffee so they can report on that. He has that bright light and he's using 
his time to find what the fingerprint of this coffee is so he can um, you know, credibly report it to us. So if they're working this hard, um, I don't see why we can't learn that language. We've, a lot has been talked and I'm one of those people that talks about the language of specialty coffee, the language of the flavor wheel, the common language of coffee. This is part of the common language of coffee and they're taking it to heart. So let's go to the next slide. So the specialty standard, in case you don't know, is based on things that we hear a lot of uh, people complaining about. And I think we started hearing the complaints when the uh, association put out their standards for what a lab needs. And mostly it had to do with teaching Q and CQI standards for the labs. And uh, I'm here to tell you that we need the lights that bright. We need the mats to be black and we need all, uh, the weights to be um, observed. And this is when we go to the technical book again, um, and I'll show you the resources in a second, but uh, the lights uh, are necessary for us to be sure about things, right? So that we're not misclassifying foxies as sours and so forth. This is stuff that should not be taken lightly if we are giving a full and credible report to somebody. Feedback to somebody has to be accurate or it means nothing. And so the standard, when you decide to use it, should be adhered to. Um, that's where I go strict, even though I'm, a, I'm aware there are nuances, but if you're gonna give a standard, please uh, meet the standard. Next slide, please. And this is where we go to the practice and application for you. What do you want? to measure for yourself? And what do you expect others are measuring for you? Because people are doing this work for you before you get the coffee and you need to know what that is. And so when you get it, you probably are used to checking it by giving it a look. And I am the first to admit that I buy pretty good stuff and I don't always grade my coffee. I grade coffee when somebody comes through San Francisco and they dump a bunch of samples at my, at my office. Somebody knocks on the door, you know, it's tough out there. So you got to do cold calls. And they come and they bring a bunch of samples and they're all manner of things. Like, I don't know if you do this and I don't know if you like this, but I have something for you to try. And I will look at it and sometimes grade it. Um, and then I taste it. And then I give feedback. Um, I will pick a coffee that looks rough and I will uh, do a full grading on it and count it out just for myself and inform the roasters what's going on. Uh, sure enough, when I have one or two uh, little problems that keep popping up, the frequency of that defect will show up in the cups. And it's important for us to make those connections. How often are you finding a half black or a half sour? If you're finding them a lot, and then every once in a while through cupping your production, which I hope you're cupping your production roasts, everybody, 100% cupping is the only way you know what's going on. Then you're gonna be, oh, another uh, stinky cup. Oh, another stinky cup. Oh, we're only getting like, you know, three cups in 20. <laughs> or are you getting one cup in 20? Or are you getting uh, five cups, 20% of the cups in 20 cups are over the course of the week or whatever you're tasting. You have a frequency of defect there that you must pay attention to and it has everything to do with what you learned when you uh, got that coffee in to your roastery. Uh, also, don't forget color of the coffee is not as important, but the odor of the coffee is important. So if you get a sample that's a new process that you've never heard of before, um, like a um, some special kind of fermentation and it smells a certain way that you've never smelled before. We need to keep our mind open. That's what specialty coffee is, open mind. And uh, accept things if it was meant to be that way. So uh, odor is important, but it shouldn't stay the same standards we always wanted it to be according to the book, which is you know, just green coffee odor. That's something to look into when you look into all these things a little bit more. So the next slide, please. 
this is about the greater vision or what do we hope to gain from grading our green coffee or sorting our green coffee. And uh, here we have a, look at that, it's a picture. It's one of my favorite pictures um, because it looks, it's just cool to look at, but it's, it can say so many things, right? Is when I was at my cafe and I ordered an espresso and then I upset the espresso in the cup and it made this cool look on the counters. It took a picture and I love it so much. But what I am trying, what typically I use this picture in presentations is to um, do that thing that everybody says that we need to do, which is all of it falls apart it, at the end, if we don't pay attention all the way along the way, right? Uh, if we fail to live up to the standards that we boast about in specialty coffee and do our part, like sorting green coffee when we suspect there are issues, we're gonna have um, kind of like, it's just not gonna come through in the cup at the end. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't stress that enough. I hope we can talk more about this particular greater vision and the why for doing green grading in the Q&A coming up in a second. But before we do that, let's move on to the next slide where I tell you about some resources. I'm wrapping it up here. The one I've spoken about most in this talk is the Arabica Green Coffee Defect Handbook, 2018 version in print. There's an older one that some of you may have. It's not that different if you have one that's before 2018. It's kind of a different shape, but essentially says, says the same stuff. This is for specialty coffee, but it's not the whole story. Uh, it's important that everybody in the specialty category, uh, the specialty sector, if you were born into it like I was, I only ever knew specialty coffee uh, from the beginning of my career, and we know there's more coffee out there besides us. <laughs> and it brings context to what we do if we know about everything. But when we're talking about specialty coffee, uh, which is most of us here in the meeting, I would say this is where you can start. It's a great resource. Um, and it's been looked over several times. And this is the third edition. Next slide. Uh, I use this book a lot. I found this on. Uh, the other day when I was making this presentation, I just searched and I found this as a used book for just under $100. When I bought this book, it was like just under $400. <laughs> um, and it's a nice thick book. It's one that tells you all about all the coffee, not just specialty. There are defects in the defect section chapter of this book that don't show up on the specialty Coffee Association Handbook, and that's great. That's fine. Uh, they have different names for the stuff we call different things. Uh, and this is just something you should know that there's not one standard out there. Again, make sure you're listening and observing and paying attention to where you are and who you're talking to, because not everybody was born into specialty the way we were. And coffee to them is uh, a bigger category. This book is a great book. I, uh, of course, I did never, I did never read this cover to cover. Um, props to you if you have read this cover to cover. Probably Juliet Hahn has done that because she reads stuff. She's a reader. I use it more like a textbook that I pull off the shelf for reference when I want to look up something, and then I can kind of pour over that chapter and learn about what's come up in my life. That's how I apply this book. Go out and get it. Some people have said they found it online digitally for free. I don't know anything about that. So don't ask me about that. Next slide, please. Um, if you go to Wrecking Ball Coffee, which is my coffee company, uh, on YouTube and just search Wrecking Ball Coffee, you will find a video. Uh, I forget how long it is, but it's uh, not me going through every single defect, but going through a lot of the defects and talking about how to go through a pile of coffee based on the green grading handbook um, sitting right next to me in that picture. And so that's free. You can watch that thing. I know a lot of people have watched it and have appreciated it. And it was my 
absolute pleasure to make it. And if I just had a little more time, I would be making these full time and giving away all this information that I can for free. Uh, watch that. And then if you have questions for me, I'm pretty easy to find on social media. I'm on Twitter as my name, at Trish Rothgeb, one word. I'm on Instagram, at Trish Rothgeb, one word. So ask me questions through there. Um, and uh, thank you very much. This is the ending with a picture of my friend, Kyungi Shin, drinking all the coffees because she wants all the coffees. And there we have it. That's the end. Trish, thank you so much. Amazing. Um, of course. Anyway, I'd like to introduce our guest commentator for the session is Dana Foster. Dana has been on the trading team with Atlas Coffee Importers for the past six years, primarily focusing on Latin America and Asia purchasing and relationships. Prior to joining Atlas, she spent five years in El Salvador, much of that time working in quality control and commercial exports for Quattro M coffees, for uh, Quattro M Cafe, sorry. Dana feels very fortunate to be able to combine her origin exporting experience along with the knowledge she has acquired working on the import side. Most of all, she's eager to see her origin partners again soon, aren't we all? Welcome, Dana. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, you for putting this on. I'm lovely. How are you guys doing? We're great. Any uh, first thoughts about the presentation? Well, I want to thank Trish. Um, I have been fortunate enough to take several classes with Trish. I actually had my first ever coffee class with Trish, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago, an intro to coffee. Uh, it was just like intro to cupping 101, I think it was. Um, and then I also had the pleasure of taking my Q course with Trish and she's just such a wonderful instructor. And I think that Thank shows you. a lot in this in this presentation. So yes. like very nice cadence and really thoughtful presentation. So thank you, Trish, as always. Um, and I know there's a lot of questions in the q and I do wanna get to those and Connie will um, take those, but I think a couple of things stuck out to me um, that, that Trish was mentioning. I think the first thing is, you really have to look at who you are in the supply chain when we're talking about green grading. There's 579 people on this call, and I'm sure that spans you know, many positions throughout the coffee chain. I'm an importer. Uh, I'm doing sourcing of coffee, also quality control, contracting. And so within that contracting process, the language of green grading obviously comes into play, and it is really important on that end. Um, I would say as an importer, we kind of let the importance, obviously we think green grading is very important, um, especially from a contractual basis, but I think it really depends on where, where the coffee is in its process. Um, and Trish also talked a lot about fairness within the supply chain and kind of putting yourself in the shoes of different folks that are all along it. So we have you know, the producers, we have the exporters, we have the millers who may not be the exporters. Um, there's so many different places that coffee is going through before it reaches your cup. And it's sometimes we do need to take a step back and say this, this isn't black and white at this point. Um, this is maybe somebody's entire livelihood because I found a rock in my, you know, coffee or a shovel head or whatever it is. I'm sure that everyone on this call has probably found some pretty interesting things in their coffee, especially talking about foreign matter. But I think we really have to like look at it in a more holistic approach. And I really appreciated that Trish stressed that. Um, we have this rule book, but there are times when depending on your role in the in the supply chain, it's your choice to kind of sway outside of the rules a little bit if you have to, um, which nobody loves to do, but it's the reality of buying an agricultural product, so. Awesome. All right, let's get to those q and I'm gonna start out with a couple basic questions. Um, this is from Kraken Coffee Roasters. I have seen Peaberry listed as a defect. Could Trish please talk a bit about Peaberry as a defect or not? Thanks for considering my question. Uh, yeah, so what I know about Peaberry, and um, anyone could correct me if I'm wrong, but Peaberry is uh, a lot of the things we work on are, are ideas we had from long ago. So back in the day, Peaberry was um, a natural occurrence that's like some have said some percentage, and I, I'm not going to even quote a percentage of your coffee is going to be Peaberry. It's when the coffee doesn't become two seeds, it stays together and um, in, in Latin America, America, they call it little snails. Um, they look like little footballs and they're smaller. Uh, 
they believe that that is a nutritional defect. So it lost some nutrition in, 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 while it was growing or uh, some reason where the coffee tree was stressed in a way and it didn't develop all the way. The shells are in the same category. In, in my mind, shells uh, are that same category. However, shells are a defect in, in the coffee. So um, the reason why we can say that it's not considered a defect is because some uh, places will, uh, they're easy to take away in that Oliver machine that you've seen. They can screen out the pea berry and then market them as something special and different. And so if people are going to be trying to make whatever money off of it, which I'm happy they figured out what to do with it and they can make it into a specialty item, more power to you, instead of having to call it a defect, the probably the scientific reason is the scientific answer is that it is probably a defect. And in some countries, uh, they will do things like the import will, you know, it used to be, uh, someone told me, and I don't know if this is true, back way back when in Germany, they like banned any pea berries from entering their country because they thought they were so terrible. Um, so that's one of those things that has nuance. It doesn't appear in the specialty uh, schedule of defects, maybe because people are trying to make a novelty point of it. Dana, have anything to add? Not on that front uh, necessarily, but I think probably the most important thing is that thank God they found something to do with it. Because when you look about what the percentage of pea berries coming out of every origin and some origins more than others, it's a hell of a lot of coffee. And you know we have this phrase that there's a home for every coffee, and we really want to believe that. Um, and in some cases, you know, it's highly sought after. And we have probably three coffees on our offer list right now that are strictly a pea berry, and we sell them very well. Um, and so that coffee is something that maybe prior to that would have just fallen by the wayside or gone into you know a lower quality, but um, I think get a better price for it. And if people are enjoying it and there's a market for it, ultimately, then I think it should go to that market. And for our customers, there certainly is. All right, next question from David Poole. Um, can you discuss water activity in relation to green grading? Not really. <laughs> That's fine too. That's a tough one. I'm not, I'm not the one. I'm not That's the a big one. one. That's uh, like I do know that. Seminar. Yeah, um, I think I wrote something in an article once where I touched on it. So I do. I don't think about it very much and I don't have a water activity uh, machine. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. You know, I'm sorry, but uh, maybe Dana has more to say, but water activity does have an, uh, imp an impact on flavor. It doesn't come to mind right now. And I'm sorry, I'm at a loss, but maybe Dana can say more. No, Drew Billups or Gavin, our lab and education staff would probably be the perfect people to speak to this. Yeah. Um, we do have a meter. We do measure water activity. Um, I would say we tend to look at it closely when we have a really high moisture coffee. Doesn't always correlate to high water activity, but that's one area where we probably look into it closer and make sure that ultimately that coffee is safe to sell to our clients. Um, but yeah, we'll get the lab people in for that one next time. It's probably more of an, in, an it'd be more of an interest if I were to wanna buy something like a Margo Ipe or a Pacamara where it's like a really huge bean size. And so I'm a little bit worried about how it was dried and if it was dried well enough, I might worry about water activity and then I would read up on it before I, I got it uh, uh, looked at. But um, I would ask my partner, importing partner, if they know much about that. About that. Um, yeah. We also had an entire session on water activity in the last row summit and the video is on YouTube. So I'm awesome. sure if you want to look at that video, it will probably tell you a lot about water quality or quality. Ah, water tells you a lot activity. about water. There you go. Um, <laughs> ladies, I don't know if you have a chance to look at the Q and A, if there's something you want answered or I can just, there's a couple of really big questions that I think we should leave to the end. Um, this one is, can you please address elephant ears in the roast and what causes it and how does it impact flavor taste? So elephant ears are one piece of what we know of as shells. So a shell can be, um, the development of the coffee bean instead of a tube 
half sizes, you have one that grows around the other like so. And then when they come apart in roasting or otherwise, they look like this. So some people call this an elephant ear. And I call this one, the one that fit inside, sometimes I call that the human ear because it looks like a human ear. Um, you just need to look at, uh, just search pictures on Google for uh, shell, it's a category is shell. And that has to do with um, bad nutrition or not enough um, irrigation when the coffee was growing. And so it is a defect and you can have more of it if you have um, a little bit more of a stressed plant potentially, but I'm not an agronomist, so I can't tell you for sure, but this is what I know as conventional wisdom. And this is not so much a flavor problem as it is a roaster problem. Roasters hate shells, because again, it's like a broken chipped cut. You don't know what shape you're roasting, uh, what size pieces you're roasting. And so you don't have a um, good heat transfer on all the coffee at the same time. All right, next question. I have a hard time distinguishing between immature beans and floaters, any tips? Well, they are opposites visually. They look completely different in green coffee, 100% different. Floaters are like little uh, ghosts. They're like little paper ghosts. They sometimes look bloated and they're like a, a very light shade of, of yellow, green. And they're when you touch them, they feel like paper mache. That's a floater. Um, maybe not so light all the time, but much lighter, sometimes a lime green. Um, and like I said, a little bit more puffed up and immatures are tinier and the silver skin is closely adhered like a little silver jacket, like a little disco jacket. And they're kind of, they look like little runts. So they're very different. Uh, if anybody has confusion, you just need to go to the books and read the descriptions, not only look at the book, the pictures, because some of us look at the pictures and we think we know what we're seeing, but we're, we're not really looking at it. <laughs> so read the descriptions carefully in the book and you'll see that those two things are the, actually the total opposites of each other visually. Okay, so we'll just jump into this big question, which I think is really interesting. When is it time to adjust the standard if the last time everyone came together to really look at all this was 20 years ago, perhaps it would be prudent to review and see if revisions need to happen. Make a point to include Africa and Asia. This question goes along with this. What do you believe? Well, I think that, well, sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm a, of a mind that 20 years is not very long. <laughs> <laughs> in the scope of coffee worldwide. I mean, the, to me, specialty is new. It's so new. You know, it's in the, in the conversation of coffee, the fact that standards exist today that are being used, it's only been 20 years of trying to get to a certain standard. Now, what I wanna stress in this talk is that the standards are a common denominator. They're not the whole story. And it would be almost impossible at this juncture with all the developments in coffee processing and everything else. Just as an example, talking about water activity as it relates to different processes that are being experimented with today, it's impossible to incorporate everything. And so to work with a standard that we have now with at least the SCA standard, uh, it's already almost impossible for people to make that cut. Uh, and so I also like to say that that only 20 years old, very young standard is aspirational still to this day, a very aspirational standard. And it's meant to push us forward and make us better. Um, I don't believe that every single one of the coffees that you have on your floor right now is specialty grade because there is a corn kernel in that coffee somewhere. There's a tiny pebble somewhere. So I, I would just say that the premise of the question is it's from my perspective, it's still a very young standard and uh, still aspirational. And it's not like we've, it's not like we've achieved it yet to where we can really look at it and say, what else do we need to include? All right. Dana, do you have anything to add? Hi, you got me right. My internet was a little wonky for a minute. Uh, I, you can hear me kind of yeah I agree with Trish um, that I think we do need to think about it as a very young industry 
in coffee, we often get, we're always compared to wine. Um, we're compared to beer. We're compared to other, you know, specialty beverage products that I think uh, have come farther than we probably have faster. Um, and I think because we're such an international community, we struggle. I mean, if you look at trying to come up with a better mechanism for pricing coffee, we've been dealing with that for the past hundred years. So to think that we are in a spot now to look at something that was just built, I think it probably is a little too premature. Um, but I do like the idea of revisiting things as often as possible um, to make sure that, you know, we are reviewing the information that we have. There's a lot of people doing work on coffee now. A lot of universities across the country with dedicated or across the world and and in the US with dedicated coffee programs. Um, so I think that's kind of a first step is beginning to look at this in more of an academic way. Um, but when you're looking at people from 30 plus countries around the world, all speaking different languages with different processes and different politics, I think it's especially challenging to get to a point where we can always be on the same page and then changing that page frequently seems a little bit complicated. Um, but I do think it's definitely worth revisiting with frequency. All right. Can you please suggest what are the physical parameters we should include in a purchase contract to make sure we're actually receiving the coffee that we selected? This is for me, huh? Or for Trish, you can go, Trish. <laughs> I mean, I think you should go take that one, Dana, because you work with contracts a little bit. I mean, obviously more than I do. Give yeah, so I'm assuming that this question, and you can put your... Uh, answer or your question in the chat is for a sales contract that you're making with an importer. I mean, generally, depending on the coffee that you're buying, if you're buying coffee from a specialty importer such as us, you're assuming that we're adhering to, you know, whatever those countries limitations are for, I don't know if the, if the question just came up, for uh, how that coffee needs to be processed. Um, and if people want to green grade their coffee, I think we would absolutely encourage it. But truly, I also believe that, you know, as an importer, we want to kind of do the work for you. That's why you're using an importer. Um, and so I think you can rely, rely on your importer to make sure that uh, we're writing our contracts with our purchase suppliers to adhere to whatever it is, you know, from whichever country that we're making that contract with, um, that we can do green grading if you ask us to and that we're doing our own well, and kind of leave some of that work up to the importer. Um, but I would say it's origin specific, if there are certain things you want that are kind of outside of the uh oh, think the CQI rule book, um, that's something you can ask us to do. Yeah, Dana, we're losing you. She's seizing up a little bit. Yeah. All right. I think she sees. She's <laughs> and just a little note about Q grading and CQI that there is no CQI handbook there is no cqi cupping standard there is no cqi branded uh specialty coffee it all comes from the specialty coffee association which created the standards cqi just created the tests that go for certification all right and this is a good question for both of you what would attribute your longevity in the coffee industry to and what advice do you have for those of us who have been for decades about feeling stagnant Hmm. Well, um, I like to teach. So I found a point, a tipping point for me that kept me going because I had learned enough to, I felt like I was able to teach people things. And so that for me helped kick a different layer of coffee. Um, but I'm also, um, I come from a family of artists. My mother is an artist. I trained as an artist. I have artists all the way back in my heritage. And so there's a piece of me that's mostly, I would say it's a huge piece of me that's mostly craftsperson. I'm a craftsperson. And if you're a craft person, for me, I told someone the other day, I just, I kind of had to have a coffee company in order to keep doing this craft, you know? Otherwise I'd have to work for other people and do their craft but I get to do mine because I started a coffee company. And it's, I'm not like, it, I'm not a titan of industry. I'm not a really, people might even tell you, I'm not a incredibly clever business woman or business person. So that craft, that interest in craft, the, the interest in watching the product from the beginning all the way to consuming never gets old for me. 
if it gets old for you, then you need to figure out something to spark it or, you know, like move on to a different sector. The great thing about coffee is there are tons of things to do in coffee. I mean, look at Connie, she has a magazine, right? You could be a, a writer, you could be an engineer, you can be an agronomist, you could be a sustainability activist, you could be a ruthless business tycoon, you could be into Bitcoin, whatever the heck that is. You could literally do anything you want. You could be a social media star. You could be anything you want to be in coffee and still be in coffee if it's the thing that turns you on. And that's that's another reason why I like coffee because I get to do my craft. And uh, when I want, when I'm lucky, I get to teach too. Dana, what keeps you here? Am I back? Am I done season up? You're done season. Oh, that was scary. Um... Uh, for me, it's the people for sure. And especially the people in producing countries that I have the great fortune to work with around the world. Um, I think I fell into it for the social side and kind of fell into it by accident, like a lot of people do. Um, not from the science side for me, not from the business side, although I'm wearing a blazer strictly for this webinar. Um, I, uh, I just love the connectivity that coffee provides. I think it's really rare um, to be able to work with people all over the world that share this passion. And for me, that's absolutely what keeps me here. And that's what's made kind of COVID and, and not getting to interact frequently with our producer partners and uh, suppliers around the world. That's been really challenging for me specifically, but that, and also that you never stop learning. I mean, we're talking about these topics here, it's evolving and you can kind of make whatever you want with it. There's so many different avenues, like Trish said. So we're lucky. We are so lucky. Dana, Trish. Thank you so much. You're Thank both you. so amazing. I'm so happy to call you friends in this crazy coffee world. And we're all so grateful that you shared your knowledge with us, with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. Thanks, Trish. Bye. As we prep for the next